Hello everyone. Uh, today we have an opportunity to continue our discussion on fluid and electrolyte balance and how it relates to the function of the kidneys and the urinary system. During the last video, we had an opportunity to look at a hormonal response in which the body corrects low levels of blood pressure or how it adjusts to decreasing fluid and electrolyte loss in the body. And remember, we called that the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. But one thing that's important for us to keep in mind here is that there are other mechanisms in place as well that assist the body in maintaining proper fluid and electrolyte balance. Now, keep in mind that in order to maintain this balance, we need the following to be true. In other words, we're saying that the kidneys need to help ensure that the intake of fluids is balanced or is equal to the output of fluids as well. So really what we're saying is that if we're low on particular fluid stores, our body will be reluctant to output any fluid. So again, our kidneys and our body is doing its best to maintain levels so that we're not too low and also so that we don't have too much. Now let's take a look at the homeostasis of the total volume of water. Now this particular image that you'll find in your notes really represents something that we can call the thirst response. And so this is really a negative feedback loop here. So if you will, please feel free to label this on your sheet. Um, what we see here at the very top is that again the entire goal of the body specifically the kidneys here is to help maintain homeostasis but let's imagine for a moment uh, that we have an athlete like the lady pictured here imagine that she's outside she's um, exercising vigorously or she's engaged in some kind of competition she's definitely going to have some excess sweating that takes place and as we talked about before with excess sweating, we are going to lose water. And so what we have listed here in our second blank or box is the fact that we'll have a decrease of volume that relates to our total percentage of body water. Now, here's how the body will respond to that. Our bodies will do any and everything in its power to hold on to any and all fluids. So if we happen to have a decreased volume of body water, our body will even decrease saliva production. Again, what our body's trying to do here is it's trying to preserve all fluids as much as possible. And so when we have that decreased saliva production, here's what our body does. It's going to give us that feeling or that sensation of having a dry mouth. And when we have that dry mouth sensation, that is meant to help uh, encourage us to increase our fluid intake and when we do that as we should that will of course lead us back to a place of homeostasis so again what we're saying here is that yes we do have the renin angiotensin aldosterone system but our body has other mechanisms such as the thirst response that are geared towards helping us to keep this homeostasis so let's talk about this thirst response with just a little bit more detail. And this next section is labeled as the regulation of fluid intake. So if you will, just a couple of things for us to look at here and feel free to create the schematic on your notes. Uh, the first thing that we'll list here is that this thirst response um, originates in something that we call the subfornical organ. I know that may be um, maybe a foreign term for you here, uh, but that subfornical organ is something that we'll actually find located in the brain. So I've got a picture here um, to hopefully help you see this a little better, and I'll try to zoom in here just so you can uh, see this. This subfornical organ, which we have the term highlighted here, uh, essentially sits just above where the hypothalamus is. And again, this is what we call our body's thirst response, or sometimes you may hear it referred to as the thirst center. 
So everything originates here as it relates to thirst. So as it originates at the subfornical organ, a message will be sent to the cerebrum. And after that message is sent to the cerebrum that alerts the body that um, we need to help regulate fluid and electrolyte balance, that is going to initiate the dry mouth response and or the feeling of thirst that we talked about just a moment ago. And so again, what that's designed to do uh, is to help encourage us to consume a beverage or something that has electrolytes in it to again return us to a place of homeostasis. Now, here's what we didn't necessarily talk about just a moment ago. It is possible to, of course, override that feeling of thirst. In other words, you could be out exercising, it could be hot and humid, you could know that you're thirsty, you could know that you're tired, and, they, and you can know that you're fatigued, but you could decide to ignore that and continue in your competition. Well, of course, we don't recommend that, and if you were to try to override that type of response from your body, that could lead you to being susceptible for heat-related illnesses. So. In the South here, we're oftentimes hearing about things such as um, heat stroke or heat exhaustion. And those are essentially two of the most compromising situations uh, that can happen um, that relate to exercising in the heat and not being properly hydrated. So let's talk a little bit more about the regulation of urine volume. So during the last video, we had an opportunity to talk about diuretics uh, for just a brief moment. So I wanted to bring that back into this particular discussion. So remember that diuretics are products or medicines that are designed to increase the release of fluid from the body. But we also have some very naturally occurring diuretics um, or things that we consume often. That would be things like sweet tea coke, coffee, um, and alcohol. And so uh, these things, again, encourage us to release a lot of water or a lot of fluid from the body. Now, right next to alcohol, we've got an asterisk here, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the consumption of alcohol directly inhibits something that we call antidiuretic hormone. So with antidiuretic hormone, this is released if our fluid and electrolyte levels are low. Now, antidiuretic hormone, the name of it kind of makes sense here. And so this hormone is released from the pituitary gland to help increase water retention. So you want to make sure you've got that written down somewhere. Again, this hormone is released from the, from the pituitary gland to help increase water retention. Now, we also have something that we call natriuretic hormones, and there are several hormones that can fit into this category, uh, but the one that we're going to explore is called atrial natriuretic hormone. And so what I'd like to do for a moment is kind of break down what this hormone represents specifically. So we've got the word atrial, then we have natriuretic, and then of course hormone. So you've probably heard the word atrial before, uh, and what this means for us is that it relates to the heart. And then natriuretic relates to the term or the phrase sodium excretion. So one thing that might help you keep this um, together or understand this uh, is that the very first part of the word natriuretic, you have the letters N-A. And so Na, of course, if you think back to our periodic table of elements, that refers to sodium. So again, atrial natriuretic hormone is a hormone that actually comes from the heart. And we're going to see here that it plays some kind of role as it relates to sodium excretion. So here's the overall physiology of how this hormone uh, helps us. So let's imagine that we've had someone that has increased blood pressure. If they have increased blood pressure, 
This, of course, is going to be sensed by the heart. And as it's sensed by the heart, the heart will help to release atrial natriuretic hormone. And what that will do then is help to increase sodium excretion. And if we can increase sodium excretion, uh, what that will do is actually lower blood pressure. So again, what we're looking at is really a negative feedback loop because we've had the reversal of a process. So let me do just a very quick terminology recap with you. Um, we've talked about two terms that are similar and we want to differentiate between the two. Uh, diuretic here relates to the excretion of large amounts of urine. And then again, natriuretic refers to the specific excretion of salt in the urine. So let's go back for just a moment here. Uh, earlier, we had an opportunity to talk about factors that alter fluid loss under abnormal conditions. And hopefully you'll remember that we talked about diarrhea and vomiting being two of the ways that we can lose uh, extreme amounts of water, essentially in one setting. And so remember, the question that we posed is, well, how do we correct this? And so if you're answering this, remember, we said that we would want to encourage individuals to replenish their water stores and to increase their consumption of electrolytes. And so again, the question is why? Why do we want to encourage them to do that? Well, remember that as we increase electrolytes, we're going to help someone increase water stores. So kind of piggybacking off of that last section that we just talked about, let's look at the effects of dehydration. And I understand that this may be a little bit blurry, um, but I'll try to zoom in here, hopefully, so that you can see it better. So what this image is meant to do is to showcase the signs and symptoms that relate to having increased amounts of uh, body weight loss due to dehydration. So if we happen to lose, let's say, roughly 3% of our body weight after some kind of uh, exercise session, um, what we're going to notice here is that we're going to have decreased blood volume and we're going to have impaired physical performance. So again, if you've lost that amount of your body weight after engaging in a bout of exercise, your physical performance is going to be severely impaired. Now, if we go up to 4%, we could say that it's going to take increased effort to engage in your physical work and that it could actually cause nausea as well with 5% then we start to see uh, there being difficulty in concentrating and then at 6% um, it's possible that our bodies begin to shut down regulating extreme amounts of temperature. So dehydration of course can become um, fatal if we're not careful and if we don't plan in advance to make sure that we're well hydrated when we engage in athletic or physical uh, sports and activities. So let's look at some predisposing factors here. In other words, what makes it possible for individuals to, um, to have those heat-related illnesses that we talked about earlier, or what makes it possible for people to become easily dehydrated? Well, the first thing that we'll list here is that uh, having improper or limited water consumption. That's the first thing. If we're not getting the needed or recommended amount of water that we need, um, of course, we're not going to be as well hydrated as we should be. Uh, secondly, there are some medicines and medications that act as diuretics. In other words, some medicines that you may take will help you to release a lot of water. And if you're not careful to replenish those water stores, you could become susceptible to um, becoming dehydrated and or having one of the heat-related illnesses that we mentioned earlier. Uh, thirdly, a consistent consumption of coffee, soda, and sweet tea. Um, if you're like me, sweet tea is my beverage of choice, specifically uh, Chick-fil-A's sweet tea, 
But if we consume those things too much or too often, we are putting ourselves at risk to become easily dehydrated. Now, here's the next one, and this relates back to something that we talked about earlier. Um, individuals that are obese or folks that carry a larger percentage of adipose tissue or fat, remember, they're going to become even more likely to be dehydrated because their bodies have less water content than someone who has more muscle mass. And then next, um, we happen to have some individuals that have hyperhidrosis. In other words, these are people who are, are heavy sweaters. Um, this means they're losing um, a lot of water and a lot of electrolytes very easily. Um, so they need to be ca careful and cautious as well to make sure that they are properly hydrating. So if you happen to be someone who wants to work with the physically active population, let's say you want to become an athletic trainer or you want to be a strength and conditioning specialist, whatever it may be, whatever field that you work in and you work with individuals that are very physically active, it's wise to help monitor their fluid intake levels uh, by measuring their weight both pre and post exercise. Now specifically, uh, this is something that athletic trainers do maybe more often uh, than not. Um, we oftentimes will have people complete pre and post exercise weigh-ins. And so what we're doing here is to help ensure that um, they haven't lost too much water. And we do this also to make sure that the next day they come back to engage in um, an exercise session, we can help see if they've regained some of their weight back. Uh, and that would be an indication for us that they've properly hydrated after, uh, in a, after an intense exercise bout or after an intense practice or physical competition session. So here's an example to show you what we mean by uh, monitoring weight, both pre and post exercise. So let's think about this. If we happen to have an athlete or someone who's engaged in competition, let's say that they weigh 200 pounds. So before they uh, engage in some kind of competition today, they weigh 200 pounds. And let's say that after a one to two hour practice session, we weigh them again and they're at 194 pounds. Of course, this would represent that six pounds have been lost. Now, if we took the 194 pounds that they're at currently after their exercise session and divided that by 200, that would give us a 97 percentage rating. And what that means is that they would have lost roughly 3% of their body weight just from that particular exercise session. So what that would mean for us specifically is that this individual is at risk for having impaired physical performance. So if we go back to uh, the image that we looked at earlier, this particular image showcases um, what could potentially happen if we have individuals that are dehydrated based on the percentage of body weight that they've lost. Uh, so, for, so again, for this individual, we would want to encourage him or her to make sure that they are properly hydrating um, so that they're, uh, one, able to uh, continue in their competition, but also for their health and safety. So let's look at the last concept here. Uh, this is referred to as Starling's Law of the capillaries and Starling's law of the capillaries refers to the exchange of water between plasma and the interstitial fluid and so we could also say it this way we could say that this law also refers to the exchange of water uh, in the blood and in the tissues so specifically uh, the movement of water between the cardiovascular and the lymphatic system is what we're referring to when we look at Starling's Law of the Capillaries. 
So again, I'd like for you to draw this image somewhere in your notes for me. Um, we have three particular things that we're going to draw here. Um, and although it's not shown here, I want to tell you exactly what these letters mean. So what you'll see here in green is VHP. And VHP stands for Vascular Hydrostatic Pressure. So I'll give you a moment to write that down. Again, VHP stands for Vascular Hydrostatic Pressure. And PCOP stands for Plasma Colloid Osmotic Pressure. So again, we have Vascular Hydrostatic Pressure and Plasma Colloid Osmotic Pressure. So let's start on the far left-hand side here. Um, the vascular hydrostatic pressure is going to represent the pressure that we would find within the vasculature, hence the name. So again, it represents the amount of pressure that we would find within the vasculature. And the plasma colloid osmotic pressure represents the amount of fluid pressure that we would find that's outside of the vasculature. So what we're saying here for this first picture on the left hand side is that if there's an even exchange between water moving in and out of the capillary, um, there's not going to be any net movement. In other words, things are going to be the same. And this is really what we want to take place. We want that equilibrium. Now, the second picture here um, represents what happens when vascular hydrostatic pressure becomes greater than plasma colloid osmotic pressure. Now, this usually happens if there's some kind of injury that we sustain, and so anything from an ankle sprain um, to um, a muscle strain can cause injury to the vasculature. And so if we happen to have an injury, what's going to happen is the amount of pressure builds up in the vasculature. And that pressure builds up so much that the fluids from the vasculature begin to pierce through and leak into the extracellular space. And so what that does is simply just relate to the fact that we have swelling that takes place. And so um, what we would typically want to do um, here is to manage swelling as best as possible. Um, swelling represents the fact that the healing process is taking place. So if you remember, we've talked a little bit about this before. So remember that we said swelling represents the fact that the healing process is taking place. So what happens is we'll initially see an injury to the capillaries first. And as the capillaries become injured, fluid from the capillaries begin to seep out into the other tissues, and that creates the appearance of swelling. Now, if we take a look at the last picture here, what this represents is what happens when plasma colloid osmotic pressure becomes greater than vascular hydrostatic pressure. Now, the reason that this happens that is usually due to some type of outside assistance. And so this is what we would want to encourage someone to do that has swelling present. We would want to encourage them to elevate their limb. And usually uh, there's an acronym that we associate with this, and you're probably familiar with it. Uh, we typically say that if you sustain some type of injury that you should do, uh, the RICE method, which is rest, ice, compression, and elevation. And so there are some variations of that, but that's something that we essentially hear all the time. And when we elevate the limb or elevate the area that's been injured, we allow that plasma colloid osmotic pressure to become slightly greater than the vascular hydrostatic pressure, and that allows fluids to be reabsorbed into the vasculature. Now, another way that we could do that is by also adding compression. So, um, again, if we have any swelling that 
results from an injury, adding compression is going to help the plasma colloid osmotic pressure to be greater than our vascular hydrostatic pressure. And again, this just simply relates to the reabsorption of those fluids. Well, that's it for this particular video. I hope this was helpful. Um, as before, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd be more than happy to assist you. Thank you.